Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As long as we believe in Jesus, our differences don't really matter. This is something you'll often hear in life when people who claim to be Christians, who claim to believe in Jesus, talk about their theological differences. That whatever those differences may be, in the end, they don't really matter as long as they still have Jesus. Now, is this a polite and friendly thing to say? I suppose so. But the more important question is this. Is it true? Does Jesus himself agree with this sentiment? And the answer is not at all, which is something he makes quite clear in our gospel text for today. So in our gospel text for today, Jesus gives us these words about beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. And then a little bit later on, he goes on to tell us how it is that on the last day, many of these false prophets will in fact be shocked to learn that they have been false prophets all along. They will be insisting that they serve the Lord and will be horrified to discover that they in fact did not. So in all of this, Jesus is saying to you, the fact that there is theological division among you is not proof that I am too big for one religion or for one denomination. It's proof that there are wolves in your midst who are trying to destroy your faith by getting you to believe things that I haven't said. And you can't simply assume that anyone who claims to be a Christian is speaking the truth. And it's not just pastors who need to know how to spot false doctrine and false teachers. You need to do it too, and you're not going to be able to spot them by looking to their outwardly holy lives. That's the lamb's wool. That will not reveal anything to you. Nor is, it, nor is it true that false prophets are simply those who know they are deceiving, but go about it clandestinely. False prophets can very easily be people who are entirely sincere and genuine and think that what they are saying is true. So you won't spot a false prophet by looking to the outward moral character of his life, and you won't spot a false prophet by being convinced of a man's sincerity. The only way that you can spot a false prophet is by the fruit that he produces, is by listening to the words that he speaks and comparing them to mine. Is the fruit that he is giving you the same fruit that I have given you? Is that man giving you the fruit that is filled with my blood and my free salvation? If he is, then don't be afraid. That's my fruit. But is that preacher or teacher giving you fruit that points you to yourself instead of to my bloody cross and empty tomb? Is he giving you bloodless fruit? If so, that ain't my fruit. That's the fruit of a false prophet. That's the fruit of a wolf. So run. So in all of this, Jesus is proclaiming to us that it is our responsibility to understand and to know doctrine, to understand theology. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to pick theological fights with people or that we should stand outside of other church buildings on Sunday morning and heckle those who are going inside. In fact, you don't even need to use the phrase false prophet when talking with those who believe or teach wrongly. With these words, all that Jesus is commanding us is to simply call, is to simply recognize the truth, to avoid the preaching of false prophets, and to clearly confess that truth to your neighbors when the opportunity arises. Jesus is here saying that when theological disunity rears its ugly head, it is your responsibility to acknowledge that it matters, that the truth needs to be confessed. And yet, very often we don't want to do this. Very often we find ourselves speaking or thinking the words, yeah, in the end, our differences don't really matter. So why is that? Well, there are perhaps a few answers to that question, but chief among those answers is that we are afraid to identify other people as false prophets. 
We pretend that our theological differences don't matter so that we don't have to do this work of spotting the wolf and judging their fruit. And the reason we are afraid to identify false prophets is because we just want to conceal and hang on to our idolatry. So we have loved sleep and sports and earning money more than we loved coming to church consistently. And because of this, we get that our church says that God is triune. We understand that our church says Jesus is fully human and fully divine and that we are justified through faith in Christ alone. But we don't always know why our church says that. We love rushing home after the service more than we love staying for the Bible class out. We don't remember really what it is that we learned in confirmation a long time ago, and so it would make sense if we want to understand the faith more deeply to show up for the adult instruction class and deepen our understanding of the word, but we just don't love the word enough to do that. We don't love it as much as the other things that we have allowed to occupy our time and our energy. And so, when false teachers show up, we don't really know what it is that we ought to do with them. So people like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses will say that they believe in Jesus, but then deny the Trinity. Others will repeat the words of popes who tell us the, who tell us the truth about God's nature and the nature of Christ, but who will share in the lie about his work, saying that Christ's death upon the cross is not in and of itself sufficient for your salvation, telling you that until your heart is producing enough good works that you cannot have eternal life. They rob us and everyone who listens to them of the peace that Jesus Christ, true God and true man, died to give us all. They offer us the fruit of self-righteousness which only yields sorrow and failure and fear. And while all this, while Jesus offers us the fruit of his own righteousness, of joy and victory and comfort, the fruit of Jesus Christ gives you the right to close your eyes on your deathbed, knowing that you have no reason to be afraid because you will be welcomed into the arms of your Savior entirely based on the work of Jesus Christ alone. And yet, the false prophets in our midst rob people of that comfort, and instead of giving them the, fr the blood-filled fruit of Christ, they fill that fruit with your own self and stick that before your eyes. And so, in all of this, we know something is amiss. And yet, we are tempted to simply say that these differences don't matter. That in the end, even though the fruit is so very different, that what they're saying and what we're saying is more or less the same. And the reason we do this is because we know that however we do it, if we accuse people of false teaching, we're going to have to back that up. And we'll have to learn how to back that up. And learning how to back up that accusation would require us to learn God's word in greater depth. And learning God's word in greater depth would require us to love that word more than the things that keep us from learning it. Or perhaps we know quite well why our church teaches what it does. We've learned the words of the scriptures. And so, for example, it's not hard to see how it is that this church over here or that church over there has departed from these words. So people will start off by saying that you are saved through faith in Jesus' blood alone. They start off with a pure fruit that is filled with the blood of Christ, but then they insist that faith is, in fact, a product of your own will. In fact, that you have to completely and totally surrender yourself to Jesus, that you must welcome him into your heart in order to believe and therefore receive salvation. 
Baptism, they will insist, is not God's work in you. It's what you do to show God that you have chosen to believe in him. The Lord's Supper is not, they insist, where God gives you forgiveness and salvation. It's where God, it's where you give God the heart that you needed to give him in order for you to be saved. And until you have felt some divine force within you, you can't be sure that you really gave your heart to God. You can't really be sure that you really believe until you're living a holy enough life. So in our congregation, in our confession of faith, we have the fruit filled with the bleeding, sinless heart of Jesus. But the wolves among us, whether they intend to be wolves or not, offer us fruit filled with man's sinful heart. And yet, very often, we pretend that we just can't see the difference. Why? Well, once again, it's because of our idolatry. We want people to like us, and we're afraid that they won't like us if we give any indication that what they are teaching and believing is false. We're more afraid of our neighbors calling us unloving and arrogant than we are of God calling us unfaithful. And so, we act like there's no difference between their bloodless fruit and our blood-filled fruit because we want to keep our idol, their love. So how is it that we get past this idolatry? How do we stop despising the pure fruit of Christ by pretending that it's no different from the false fruit of false prophets? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. You simply eat the blood fruit of Christ. You eat that pure fruit. You hear that pure word. You hear about the forgiveness and mercy and salvation of Jesus Christ. And when you do, that forgiveness and mercy and salvation will actually make you hate your idols. And when you hate your idols, you will no longer try to preserve them by turning a blind eye to the corrupted, bloodless fruit of the false prophets. So, are you ashamed of your theological ignorance? Are you embarrassed because you just don't know enough to be able to articulate your faith? Do you want to stop loving the things of this world more than you love learning the word of God? Then the solution is easy. Come hear the word of God. Push everything else off your calendar. Come to church when the divine service is done. Come downstairs for Bible study. Sign up to go through instruction and to study the catechism again. And when you do that, this is what you're going to hear. You were once a sinner covered in your idolatry. Because you loved the things of this world more than you loved God, you were starved of the righteousness of God. You had none of the holiness that he requires of you to inherit eternal life. But out of love for you, Jesus Christ has given you everything you need. He's drowned your sins in his blood. He has covered your idolatry in his perfect holiness and his perfection. He has emptied his veins and won for you with those empty veins the love of God. With his dying breath, he has accomplished the peace that you no longer need to accomplish. And when he rose from the grave, when he burst forth from the tomb, he did not come out of that tomb empty-handed. He came out with his hands filled with fruit, fruit that was made from his blood, fruit that gives you everything he won for you with that blood, everything that you need to stand before God and to be declared worthy of eternal life. It is all found in the blood fruit of Jesus Christ. It's found in the word preached within these walls. So come hear that word. Come believe it. Come feast on the blood fruit of Jesus Christ because the more that you feast on Christ's salvation, the less you'll want everything that isn't Christ's salvation. 
Likewise, the more that you eat of Christ's blood fruit, the more easily you will be able to recognize when someone is offering you a fruit that doesn't give you the blood of Jesus, a fruit that points you to your own good works instead of the cross. And when that happens, because you've been feeding on the pure, righteous fruit of Christ, and because you know that Christ has taken away your idolatry, you will no longer be a slave to your idolatry and say what it commands you, that these differences don't matter. When a false teacher denies his hearers the peace that Christ died to give us, you will know how to point to them and say, that is a wolf. And if people know what you mean, you'll know how to answer. You may not be able to do this as well as you like today, but keep coming. Keep feasting on Christ's righteousness. Keep eating his blood fruit. And soon, you'll know exactly what to say when the wolf offers you the bloodless fruit instead. Are you ashamed at how you've wanted to throw away the pure fruit of Christ in order to get the approval of men? Well, if you are, once again, the solution is easy. Come hear God's word. Come receive his sacraments. Come eat the blood fruit of Jesus. And when you do, you will find that you're no longer hungry for anything else. Come hear your pastor tell you that all your sins are now forgiven, erased, forgotten, destroyed, and buried forever in the tomb that once held the dead body of Jesus but could not hold his resurrected flesh. Come direct your eyes to the baptismal font and see that your sinful, stubborn heart kept rejecting and despising Jesus, but then the Holy Spirit came to you in the waters of baptism, killed your sinful heart, and gave you the sinless, perfectly obedient heart of Jesus Christ, the heart that had perfectly obeyed all of God's commandments, the heart that earned eternal life. Look at that font and see that the waters of your baptism have given you eternal access to the blood fruit of Christ, to the fruit that will always conquer and kill your sins, even when you have committed the same transgressions over and over and over again. Come kneel at the altar and see that no matter how weak and pathetic you are, you don't need to make yourself strong. Your strength is found in the forgiving flesh and forgiving blood of Jesus Christ given to you through the bread and wine. Your strength is found in the blood fruit of your Savior. So come do this, because the more that you find the favor of God in absolution, in baptism, and in the Lord's Supper, the less you will hunger for the approval of false prophets who deny the power of these mysteries. Beware of false prophets, you will recognize them by their fruits. These words are not a charge that Jesus gives merely to pastors. It's a charge that he gives to all of the baptized, to every single one of you. Now granted, you don't have to articulate the faith as well as your pastor. And you certainly don't need to go out of your way to find false teachers to rebuke. But when you encounter them, when you encounter doctrinal division, Jesus does not give you the luxury of saying, well, these things aren't important anyway. Rather, Jesus has given you a far greater luxury. He's given you the luxury of looking those divisions square on, of staring those false prophets right in the face and saying, these differences, these things are supremely important because the God who died for my sins spoke the truth to me and I have the right to hear it. Jesus Christ died to feed me with his salvation and so I have the right to to eat it. Jesus Christ has given me his blood fruit. I don't need to settle for anything less. Amen.